invited me, or having invited myself, I probably should have here. Thank you for accepting my invitation to come. Um, I, I was here actually in a lot doing some stuff. I'll show you some pictures of it at the end, diving in your beautiful water. Uh, and I'll show a little bit about how that relates to what we're doing. Um, but I'm glad to speak to a lot of students and graduate students, because I was going to say I was going to involve. This is one of the most exciting times in neuroscience. young in neuroscience right now is a great thing. Um, I'm going to talk to you about, uh, I made a sort of transition in my science back around 2002, um, and I'm going to talk about that. My science is now uh, sort of dedicated to this. Um, so since we've begun in neuroscience, and since I began, and I think since forever in neuroscience, one of the, the long-term goals of neuroscience has been to sort of show how small and large networks of neurons process sensory information and produce behavior. And I think that, that's one of the sort of holy grails sort of understand from sensory perception to motor action the entire network of activity. And it's a, it's a goal that I think has been achieved maybe in Leach and probably nowhere else. Um, and maybe we all want to do that, we haven't quite been able to do it yet. I think that's kind of a, a large goal. Um, and I think that this, in the end, one of, one of the things this will require, amongst several others, is monitoring the activity of a large number of cells. Self-identified cells, cells in the pathway, to see their activity during, uh, during a behavior. Right? So, I like to say that sort of connecting behavior to, to anatomy and activity it probably requires this activity that I mentioned, normal activity mapping, as well as connectomics, or as I like to call it, connect, functional connectomics. So everybody's aware of these things. We need very high resolution mapping of these circuits. We need comprehensive mapping. I've spent my life also doing DM and sectioning and histology, but we, we need the new sort of great leap forward in that area. We need what we, what we think we're doing, which is very high resolution mapping. Right? And I think we have the informatic system but we need high temporal resolution of our of electrical activity in the brain. We need spike train activity and we need multi-site. So very, these are huge, challenging tasks. And this is what you guys will have to do. Um, now, the way that we used to do this, and the way we still do it, is with electrodes. And the way I've done this for most of my life is using electrodes. And these are, you know, these are just examples of the types that are out there. Patch clamping, where you can get very nice. Electrode recording, which is uh, small extracellular uh, wires, glass, which work wonderfully, uh, and get oh. very high resolution information. And this has been the sort of uh, the basis for all modern neuroscience, understanding how cells fire and relating that to behavior has been sort of a hallmark. And what we're trying to do optically is try to enhance this performance, to try to do something optically, an identified cell, possibly more cells, so I can listen basically. So having been a physiology guy my whole life, electrophysiology, um, I love doing electro-based recordings, but as I, as I looked at it, they, it's very few cells, considering the number of cells within the brain that you can record at any given time. Uh, they have really damaging effects on the tissue, especially if you go into deeper layers. And then it's very difficult to get the identity of the cells, what cells they are, what's the neurochemistry, where they project, things like that. And so we've been trying to make the sort of precision of molecular biology with, these, uh, with the questions that you want to ask in physiology. So what I'm going to talk about is optical electrophysiology, and this is not really a new topic. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is new, the part of it is new. And the idea is to use optical indicators. These are sort of small molecules that go in the membrane of the cell and monitor electrical activity in the cell branches. So um, Andrew Grinwald is here, and he's real sort of the pioneer, along with Larry Cohen in the US, of using small molecules. These are small fluorescent dyes that you can put into the membrane of the cells, and they will change their fluorescence based on probably don't know much about them because they're not very widely used because they're very difficult to use and the signals they produce are very small. So what I'm going to talk about is sort of the new generation of probes, which are genetically encoded probes. So this talk is going to focus on protein-based probes. These are probes that encode in DNA so you can use all the beauty and the specificity of molecular biology and get a, a voltage signal. So, so why do we need these? This is a new slide I put in because people be asking me why do we need them when we have G-camps. So I'm going to try to defend the need to have these. I don't know how many of you are familiar with G-camps. Are genetically encodable fluorescent proteins that, that sense levels of uh, calcium. And they're absolutely beautiful and they work very well. I'm going to try to argue that I think voltage is, is as important or even more important to be able to measure. Uh, so I'm going to give you uh, my three reasons why we should use uh, voltage sensors instead of calcium, or in addition to calcium, let me put it that way. Uh, they give you definitely better temporal resolution because the 
Towson Sindel and Elisa Prosody, which now will turn the Sindel action potential into uh, something that's on the order of about 200 milliseconds. So this is the size you get from ZCAMP 6S, which is slow, and this is fast ZCAMP. Uh, you get a signal that from a single action potential that's 200 milliseconds is quite large. I mean, no action potentials <coughs> are on the order of about a millisecond, so you take a millisecond event and convert it into a 200 millisecond event. Now, that's a good thing, because otherwise you couldn't detect it, because the detectors are not so good. So there's an advantage, and I'll we'll come back to that, of taking something as, as small as a action potential. When we do electrophysiology recordings of electrodes, we often you know, digitize 5,000 hertz or 10,000 hertz so that we can get the shape of the waveform. But you know, imaging at 5,000 hertz is you know, very difficult to do. So I would say that there's better temporal resolution. Uh, I, I think there's better spike signal linearity. So in other words, you get one spike, you get one signal with your camera. Two, two spikes, you get another signal, but it becomes nonlinear. So I think you're going to see better linearity with the calcium signal. These are sort of my, my beliefs, or people could argue this. Um, it's a direct measurement of the most relevant communication mechanism of neurons, which is electrical, which is not calcium, it's electrical signaling. Uh, this is a typical calcium recording, or maybe I should say one of the better calcium recordings, uh, done by Carl in uh, Canelli Farm, Carl Stavota. And what you see is action potentials producing these calcium busts, but in between you don't see a whole lot. And that's not what's happening electrically. What's happening electrically to a cell is that there are lots of stuff going on. I'll show you uh, hyperpolarization, and that sort of brings us to the, the third thing here, is you're actually you see hyperpolarization from some threshold events that are not always evident with calcium signal. So for that reason, I think voltage, you know, fluorescent voltage sensors are useful. They're incredibly challenging to try to do this. It's very difficult to do this. Um, of course, I do it, so I'm telling you that. I'm impressed at what I did. Uh, but it is quite difficult. First of all, there are no naturally occurring proteins that do this, unlike rhodopsin, which are kind of easy to do. <laughs> they just found crazy organisms, took those things, and that's what they do. They just sign right on them, they open channels, bingo, we're all in shape. There isn't anything out there that we know of that is fluorescent or bioluminescent will change its intensity uh, with increases in voltage. That we know of. It's not to say it isn't out there, but there is nothing in the, in the literature, nothing in the genome database. So that means we have to synthetically engineer this thing from the ground up. Now, GCAMPs are synthetically engineered. And the problem has been the ones that we've developed, there's no clear mechanistic understanding of how the voltage rearrangements that I'll talk about produce the changes in fluorescence. So that's problematic for those of us who are thinking. If you want to think your way through this, it's kind of tough because it's, it's difficult to understand how they work. Um, and then the screening for these probes needs to be in cells that have resting memory potentials and that you can invoke controlled um, steps in. And that requires, in the past, generally patch planting. That's a slow, laborious process for patch planting to do. Um, and I'll show you ways we've gotten around. Membrane insertion, unlike GCAMs, which are soluble. Membrane insertion for cell biology world is really tough to do that reliably and accurately. Uh, and the design space is enormous. So what I mean by that is, in terms of the voltage sensors we have to choose from, the fluorescent proteins that we have to combine and everything, it's an enormous space. So it's a, it's, a, it's a big, it's a heavy lift. So to give you a quick background on where we got to and how we got here, the first thing to be discovered as a genetic encoder built this probe is a company called Flash by Lee Yusikoff who's at Berkeley. Um, and they were looking at this shape of the casting channels, so they, they shoved a bunch of GFPs on it, or a single GFP, and when it formed a channel in this one position, you could make steps, here they have patch clamping in this case, an oocyte, and they've held the resting member potential, and now they're stepping them, you can't see the steps, but they do. And now you see uh, gating charge movement, and you see this change in fluorescence. This is the first recording of something where you could see the change in fluorescence, and the change in voltage. Now, a lot of problems with it, with oocytes, extremely slow, you can see this is 500 milliseconds, and you do the step and it kind of doesn't really come to full, full post, yeah, 500 milliseconds. A guy named Thomas Knopfel published something a couple of years later using um, a different potassium channel and a FRET pair, a cyan fluorescent protein and a YFP, that, that when, they, when the channel moved, they separated and you saw a FRET signal. Um, and then we published one a few years later, which was based on the sodium channel from cells and muscle. So these are what I call the generation one probes. And um, they worked really well. We all discovered them on sites. And then we all got together, the three of us, as a group, and had a grant together. And the first paper we published was saying that none of these work very well. <laughs> uh, 
remains the only class of proteins that are voltage sensitive enzymes. Right? So it, it, it doesn't actually own the membrane, it just sits in the membrane and regulates the activity of this phosphate. It has a classic um, S4 domain, and the S4 is an important domain because it has these charges, and those charges reside in the membrane, positive charges, and those are the ones that move in relation to the, the voltage. So as the voltage changes, you can imagine those things are going to are charges in the voltage field and they move up and down. And when that moves up and down, it affects the activity of this enzyme. So we took this, all of us, we chopped that enzyme off and we stuck fluorescent proteins on it. And it turned out that this thing targeted better the cell membrane. And again, a whole bunch of generation two probes came out. And those were based on that protein. These are tonosinopsis proteins and the ones from our group in Japan. Um, and these are given signals like this. Now you're starting to see bigger signals and they started to work in mammalian cells like HEK cells, okay? So again, as a group, we all did this as a group at the time. Uh, we were all competitors and we actually got together, which was unusual, and we had a very fractious grant together for several years, but we worked, worked together and tried to improve those. The signals that those had worked, but they were very small. And so this is a kind of a, a summary of, of, I don't know, somewhere around six or 700 different construct styles that we worked on as a group. Because we ended up with, in this first round, about 600 different constructs that we manually passed grants and tested. And I don't want to bore you with the details, but we went through lots of different things and everything looked exactly the same. Everything ended up looking like those second generation probes, like this one, for example, which was one of the better ones, um, the TV tomato. And this is a probe that has the S1 through 4 of CNN and has two red fluorescent proteins. I'm going through this quickly because none of this worked that well. I don't want to waste your time with it, but we were producing these types of probes that produce about 3%. This is a number to keep your eye on. 3% change in activity with 100 millivolts enormous depth and a small chain. Already about 100 times better than the voltage sensitive dyes of Greenwald and Cohen, but still not, not, not that good. One of, the, one of the constructs that I made uh, in this random search, which is what this essentially was, was using this fluorescent protein in the same position. Um, it's a pH sensitive, and what I mean by that is that most TFPs have this relationship of fluorescence to pH, where they do not fluoresce and then they fluoresce and you get more basic. This one was shifted over a little bit. This is the this is the protein that's in synaptophorin, which is a great little tool made by Jim Rothman's lab that allows you to detect synaptic transmission. If you ever read about it, it's a really nice probe for that. We took that FP and we put it in and we had we got the same crappy probe with exactly three percent. It had that little fast thing at the beginning, so we had some interest in it. Um, so we made um, we made a bunch of um, stable cell lines. We made 13, I always remember this number. We made 13 stable cell lines of this clone to test it and work with and play with it. And all 12 of the 13 gave this response. Now, from the rest of the slides, I'm going to flip for conventions, uh, convention that we've adopted from Larry and the crowd. I'm going I'm I'm to flip this so that this signal, which is a negative signal, I'm going to flip it to positive because it looks better. Uh, but anyway, so this is a positive voltage step, and this is what you get. lines we made, the 13th line looked like that, right? So when we tested all of them, just to be careful, uh, we saw this, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. So we had a lot of excuses of why that might have been, but I insisted that, 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 that the student um, sequence this. So we took this tech cell, and we ground them up, and we sequenced the DNA, and we found that there's a single point mutation in this construct, that it happened by, by accident. And it was uh, the 227 is uh, A, Whereas the protein was changed to a D. And we confirmed that by putting that into the protein and showing that that could happen. So what I'm going to talk about through a small part of this talk now is that construct. I'm going to tell you how we improved it and then how we figured it out. And that's what this construct looked like. This was a crystal of the S1 and 4 through the domain of Siona attached to this fluorescent protein. So that's the simplicity of that protein. It sits in the membrane and it has an S4 that moves and it changes the, the fluorescence <coughs> of that. So just to show you how just incredibly lucky I was. Um, this is the original, the size of a, of a 100 millivolt step in the original construct, and that's the one that, that was accidentally made. Right? So we went back to that position and we mutated it to every other amino acid and not, no other amino acid looked as good. Even, so this is aspartic acid, for those of you who don't know that D and D is aspartic acid, and its relative is butanic acid, which is different by only a single carbon, the same side chain. So even a difference of one carbon. 
better than this, but we actually had calculate the probability of getting this construct by accident is pretty much astronomical. Anyway, so I'm sure that someone upstairs is sort of paying attention. <laughs> anyway, um, we, we did everything and nothing looked as good, although many of them looked much better, right? Some of them looked worse, but much of them looked better. Um, this was clearly important. We did get to do something uh, intellectual, because up to this point it was just luck. This is that pro. Um, we then moved around the FP a couple of amino acids. Just to show you the difference, if you go at, at now, now I'm showing you that the best one, which was right around 15%. So we moved it a few amino acids upwards, and the, the signal almost doubled. By the time we were finished, we went from 15 to about minus 40. So we did something smart, like moving it around and got this enormous increase in pro. So now we have pro. We started showing you when it was 3%. Now we're at 40% delta F. Um, so this is the, this is what it looks like. So this is the this is the fluorescent protein. It's like EGFP, but it has a series of mutations, as I told you earlier, that made it pH sensitive. So we wanted to figure out. So the first thing we did was take that mutation and put it in EGFP, and it didn't do anything. It just it doesn't work with the probe, and if you add that mutation, it doesn't help. We, we then added all the mutations and, and we could bring it back again and found that we could eliminate most of the mutations and found that only these four mutations in EGFP are required to convert it to this enormous signal. And one of them is the pH sensitivity. You have to have a shift in pH sensitivity to make these probes work. So this is um, HEK cells, transfected, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a, of a secret here. This is with baclovirus. Does anybody know what baclovirus is? How many people know baclovirus? is a virus that infects insect cells only. These are human cells. So it does infect human cells. Um, it's a new technique we developed. So this is that, those cells infected with this probe just to show you what they look like. So these, these are HEK cells that we also have a, a potassium channel in and a sodium channel. So they're like fake neurons. And that's what they do in a dish, just recorded with a camera when they have this probe. So all I've done to this image is I've taken the red thing light when it's down and I've subtracted it. So I've only done one linear subtraction of a single value from all these. And so this is a wave. Now remember, the, the probe is actually going down in intensity. So every time you see it get dark, these cells are all firing and action potential. And that action potential so that's at 20x. If you look at it at 40x, the plate, this is a, a 96 wall plate, and so these cells are sort of all grown around in a circle like that. And when you look at it at 4x, that's what the cells are doing. And that's about a quarter of the speed. So they're doing this bizarre, like, you know, circular pattern of activity. You know, just, I don't know what they're doing, talking to themselves or whatever. <laughs> but are they connected? So they don't have synapses, good question. <laughs> these are not neurons, they don't have synapses, but they're all connected by gap junctions. So one cell goes off. And they'll stop doing this, which is a really cool story. They stop doing this, and you, you can just tap the plate. They go, and then they stop. And you tap the plate, and they'll do it again. You can electrocute them, and they'll do it. You can do all kinds of flashlight on them, and they'll start doing it. No, in South America, they'll go the other way. In South America, they definitely go the other way. <laughs> Good one. All right, so, so then we wanted to see, okay, can we work this upwards? Can we get it into uh, neurons? So this is a neuron uh, in the dish, you know, looking like an ugly neuron in the dish looks. But this is a good picture. We're very happy about this. This shows that it's in the membrane. We measured various aspects of the cell's um, properties. So we measured action potential, amplitude, we measured width, and we looked to see if there's any change between having this expressed and not. So does the expression of this affect the neuron? And as far as we can tell, it doesn't affect. If you overexpress significantly, you get some changes, slight changes. <coughs> slight changes here, actually, in the duration of the action potential. Slightly gets longer, which is what you expect if you increase the capacity. So this is how it looks when a cell is in a dish firing. So this is a, a patch clamp recording of a, of a cell spiking, right, spontaneously. And then this is the optical signal. So you get, you, you can see one to one the spikes in the cell. Now, they're broader, because this is a low, low pass filtered probe. So it takes this one millisecond action potential and spreads it out. And if you notice, it looks like it starts before, but what it's actually responding to very well, it responds very well to very slow movement as being a low pass, it's showing you this step potential, this foot potential as it comes up before the spike, and then the spike takes a while to decay and blah, blah, blah. So you see, you even see these small things are showing up as large. So it's definitely emphasizing the slow voltage changes. So this is a picture from Rafe. This is a cell, this is an actual this is a video of the cell sitting in the dish, spiking on its own, and as it spikes, it's, uh, you can see it's, it's getting dimmer. So this is without an electrode on the cell, 
So the first thing we tried to do with this was, okay, this works really great in culture. We can just look at cells. We don't have to just look at spike activity or change the answer. We don't have to patch plant the cells in order. Let's see if it works in a fly. So we put this into Drosophila because it's quick and easy. And the beauty of Drosophila is that you can target your things to very few cells. So what we did is we targeted, um, and these, these are living flies, so we do this under a microscope where we, we do a little surgery on the fly, so brain surgery for flies, where we open a little hole and we look down and we record the activity in the brain optically. And then in some cases, you'll see also an electrode and we'll patch onto a, a cell there. And we pick some cells in just off of that are easy to patch. Most cells in just off of are not easy to patch. It's really impossible to use to date. So this is the brain of the animal, out, spread out on a plate, and there's these few cells we've labeled here. And there's a sort of diagram of what they look. You can see the cell bodies. These are these LMDs. These are circadian neurons. I don't explain why the guy didn't go work with like circadian neurons. So we put these in these cans. There's very few neurons. We take them to like five or six on each side of the brain only that we label things. And then this is a patch plant recording of one of those cells. And I wanted to highlight that these are very <coughs> tiny, tiny actions actually that we're trying to record. And this is the optical recording from that cell. And you see spikes here. You also see what I what I, I hope you see. In this case, the cells. Bunch of different cells here, one, two, three, four cells. And then they're firing sort of different patterns amongst them. And then sometimes they're synchronized. Here they become synchronized later on in the recording period. So you can see hyper you can see these sub threshold synchronizations that all of these cells have. And then they drop out of sync when they hit them on. So you can you can look at sub threshold events that aren't just, you know, with a calcium probe you might see just the spikes. You wouldn't see this large. You can do the similar thing you can do with physiology. We wrote algorithms that can look at the optical trace and pick spikes out of it. So here's the patch plant recording, and there's the optical trace. And you can again see here, because it's spread out more, how big the action potentials become. Um, and then the computer goes along and puts marks as to where the spikes are, and it's quite easy given the signal from noise for a program to do this. So this is sort of spike sorting optically done. You can have the thing optically find cells, the computer, and sort it. So here's a patch plant recording of this cell. And this cell is spiking, and this, this is what the uh, program is selected as a spike, right? But then in the cell next to it, the program, which is not passed, the program will sell different spikes. So you can do multi-cell recording, which is quite important. You can look at cells that are, as I mentioned, here's some cells over about a half an hour recording. We're here where they're highly correlated and they're highly synchronous, and then they go out of synchrony. As you can see by the other correlation plots, they're synchrony, asynchronous, and then back into synchrony. So you can do kind of, you know, experiments that are more difficult to do with pets per se. This is something you can't do at all currently with pet pets. This is these cells recording here, but then recording out in their dendritic, where all the action in the cell phone is out in the dendritic before all the processing happens. So you can record the cell body here and here, and you can see these nice spiking behaviors. But then you can change the focal plane and look at these blurry, because it's a high speed camera, which is recording for done at about 500 frames per second. But you can draw around dendrites, in this case from these, and look at the dendritic action. Um, what I brought out at the beginning about, about G-CAMP, so I'm going to show you now experiments where we did G-CAMP in the same cells versus this arc light. So here's arc light where we do a hyperpolarizing step in the cell and you see electrically the hyperpolarizing and then optically you see a really clear hyperpolarization. Then you can see spikes here, little these spikes and these spikes. So you're seeing hyperpolarization. So in the same cells, if we put G-CAMP, this is G-CAMP 5 in the exact same cells, now you see the cell spiking electrically, and this is what you see optically. When you do hyperpolarization, that's what's happening, that's what you see optically. Spikes, so these cells don't even report spikes in calcium signals. So if you didn't, using a calcium probe, you would not see spiking in these cells. What we did is we, it's either too small, it doesn't produce enough calcium, I'm not sure what we did. If we put, we then put, because we thought there was some artifact, we put MAC back, which is this uh, bacterial sodium channel that causes these massive spikes, which these things are on the order of like 100 millivolts. But then you start to see a calcium signal, enormous calcium signal, but nonetheless a calcium signal. So if you hear calcium signal, you can see it. So that's a little bit of my sales pitch about why the voltage is better. You can do experiments, again, that are, this is something that's perplexed the circadian field for a long time. These cells down here, um, people could not get past my recordings on them. And when they got, when they got loose patches on it, they didn't see any firing differences morning and afternoon, even though it was predicted by the models that said it would knock these cells out of effect circadian rhythm and hour. So all we did in, in several experiments was just put our ROI at these nerve terminals here or on these cells, but mainly on the nerve terminals. And in the nerve terminals, it was 100% clear in the morning. They were firing rapidly. And in the evening, they weren't. And you can see it easily in graphs of standard deviation or in the power structure of the signal. So it immediately answered the question, are these cells related to circadian activity? Uh, this is not something that 
changing, as the animal's moving around the place, they're changing the temperature by two degrees, right, up and down. And they monitor the temperature, and then you see electrical activity is beautifully monitored up and down. You know. more, a little more reliable even than the Kelsey system. Anyway, this is something that we did in collaboration with, with another group. They're trying to phenotype human um, ES stem cells. They're trying to phenotype these prior to using them as, as cardiomyocytes. And they normally put them on multi electrode arrays and things like this. So then, in this case, we put arc light into them, and uh, they just see, you can see the cells kind of flashing. That's a higher power view of one of them. And here the cells are in arc light and flashing. So they can easily phenotype these cells. Is this real time? Uh, that is. that 
that somehow enhancing electrical activity in the cortex is what we analyze a body part. And as soon as it opens, it becomes much more diffuse. So, um, so that's our light. That's the protein that we're most interested in at the moment. And obviously, continuing to improve the signal. I, I, we have a, a, something I'll talk about in a moment. We have a new protein that I'll present here. It's not out published yet, but this is a red version that's not quite as good in signal size, but it has two huge advantages. First of all, it's red. This was uh, developed with Robert Campbell up at, up at Tetform, uh, I'm sorry, Alberta, Canada. And this is a positive going signal. So everything I've shown you is that our light is high fluorescent, then it goes down, which is actually not what you want. You really want one that's dark, that goes bright, like the G-CAMPs do, but we have not been able to develop one like that in the green space. This is a red one that does go up, actually. So these are positive going. It's faster than our light, but the signal sizes today are smaller. But we're excited about this for a couple reasons, and we're trying to improve it. Um, there's a lot of other. It does, but it's small. It's, but it does, though. It does. Um, so this, this is this is a little bit of the history about this stuff. This is what I mentioned by Udi's lab way back in '97. So it's taken many, many years to create probes, and there was a sort of dead zone in the middle, which we all spent working and having. You know, basically the probes. This was the first generation, right? And then these failed, and then this was sort of second generation which failed, and then most recently there's been a whole bunch of. There's a lot of new probes that are out there since we published our probe on ArcLight, and I wanted to kind of give you an idea. The space has opened up a lot. There's a lot more laboratories involved in it. This is, and these are the design structures that have become are successful, at least, at least published as successful. Um, several uh, of this built, where you have, we have spore and this, and then we have some before, and then you have spread pairs. There's also what they call a butterfly version, where you stick one on either side, yada, yada. Split cans in the case of FF1. We have a split FP on the outside. Um, I'm telling you all this because We've now been examining all these to see which ones are going good and which ones are going to warrant moving forward. Um, there's now even a whole group of them based on um, opsins. So I'm sure most of you are familiar about the channel opsin from, from the optogenetic space. But it turns out that, that the, the retinol, that's the chromophore, <coughs> resides in the membrane within the voltage field and, and exhibits uh, photochromism, which is when you, or electrochromism, which changes its uh, fluorescent output with voltage. So it's actually a, a naturally occurring. I don't want to call it fluorescent because opsins are not actually fluorescent by the definition. They have a very weak frequency of fluorescence, but that fluorescence is voltage dependent. So, um, so these have been getting a lot of a lot of press lately, a lot of media. Um, we're not very happy with them, as practically speaking, because because it's mainly because they're extremely weak. The fluorescence, the quantum yield of these, and the brightness of them is about a thousand times lower than GFP. So to get these traces, they have to go to heroic methods and sort of cameras and lasers, and it's all done in vitro. And today, not. Today, nothing has been done in vivo with them. We've tried a lot of it in vivo. Uh, there's, there's Quasar, which is another version of it. Um, same story. Um, the one we are interested in is one that came out of Michael Lin's lab at Stanford. This is uh, FF1, similar to the design of ours. We, we gave him our chicken uh, DSP because that protein that was found in Siona has since been found in most other species, uh, um, for most other uh, legged species and above. Uh, and we, that protein, they use circular permutator and got a much faster probe than ours. Um, and so they published it as, as such. However, it's also negative going, um, smaller signal, but faster. And we we used to look for fast probes in our lab and we stopped doing that because these probes are too fast. In fact, this probe is probably as fast as an action potential. It pretty much follows action potentials very faithfully, but almost too fast to record optically. So this requires recording, in this case, about a thousand dish, it doesn't work in vivo. It's much too difficult to get that to work well. So, um, now the problem with these things is that, like I said, they look great in culture dishes and don't work well. So what we started doing is taking all these various probes, putting them into flies, and to make a really long story short, nothing works but our probe. Of course, you would have already known that. Because I'm here. Um, we don't like any of them, and we are actually in the, in the business of trying to make them better. So we, the only one we're interested in working with is this probe asset because we've tested it in cultured neurons ourselves, and it looks looks good, it looks uh, they reported. However, in soft neurons, I showed you these nice traces, it gives a very small signal. Which is awful, although it's faster, and you actually can solve action potentials, not not so good. You know, so we're trying to improve our signal, let's put it that way. So just for everybody's interest, we've made flies of everything. And if everybody wants flies, they can write me. If anybody wants any of these probes, they're all on AdGene. If you want virus, it's all available at UPenn, and the mice are now available uh, if you'd like them. 
they're just becoming available. So, so, so now I'm going to just go through quickly at the very end a couple of new ideas, uh, stuff that I think is kind of cool. So where are we at in this development process? There's no doubt that the, that our site, which I think is the best, is nowhere near as good as GCamp 6, for example. By the way, GCamp is pretty good too. So obviously there's a long way to go to make these as good as there. But those guys spent years in a lot of screens. We're looking for redshift Gebbies, like the one that I showed you, but the traffic better. Uh, that one doesn't travel particularly well. The red coalescent proteins don't work well. In general, they don't work well. It took years and years to develop our geckos and the red calcium centers that don't work as well um, because of the nature of the fluorescent proteins, and I can talk about that later. Um, we want ones which increase the depolarization for reasons which I won't go into. We want brighter ones that produce larger signals, clearly. A little slower kinetics because we like to record with 2P, uh, two photon microscope. And we'd like ones that record absolute voltage. So to get there, we've developed a system in our lab which streams spore probes in some sort of semi-automatic high throughput. We use 96 well plates of neurons. And so we make primary isolated neurons. We let them grow for several weeks with these plates. And then we transpect mutagenesis libraries into them. And we have an automated system that identifies, so this is a field of view, several fields of view stitched together that the camera takes. And it stimulates them electrically or optically using optogenetics. And we get these recordings. And then the, the program evaluates to determine their mean amplitudes and their speed and things like that. So it automatically can go through the whole plate and look for things that are, that are improved. And from that, we found some positive run ones and some slightly larger, which we'll, we'll write about. So I have also spent a lot of my time trying to find completely radically new fluorescent proteins and radically new ways of doing this. Um, and what I'm going to tell you is that all the successfully Gekis and Gebbies are based on highly fluorescent, autonomously folded fluorescent so GCAMs and our proteins are based on that. Uh, these other ones, these opsin probes, I would say, are not brightly fluorescent, right? So I think this is the place to look for things that are highly fluorescent. And autonomous means they don't require added things. There's other fluorescent proteins in the world that are very bright, but you have to add complicated substrates to get them to work. So, so the question I thought is, like, is GFP the only protein family? There's probably 180 orthologs from other animals of GFP that have been cloned, but they're all basically the same thing. They have the same beta barrel, same chromophores, there's four still chromophores, and we've sort of beat those things to death. So is there things outside? And finally, can we develop bioluminescence for these reports? So something our lab is working on now is bioluminescence. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So we've spent, I don't know, the past eight years searching in the ocean for fluorescent proteins because the ocean is a perfect place and probably the only place where fluorescence as a, as a scheme of coloration makes any sense because it's the only monochromatic environment. So this is a plot of sort of photon density at the surface, and as you get down to 100 meters, Literally, it's a monochromatic environment. It filters out all the light of the world. So if you want to have color in the, in the reefs, you have to produce your own photons, right? Because the red and green and everything is absorbed by the water or diffracted by the water or, or scattered, sorry, by the water. So you ask, well, if, you know, is there other things down there? And the answer is probably yes. Um, and this creature kind of gives us all hope. This is the mantis shrimp, which is definitely the coolest animal on the earth, bar none. If you read about them, you'll know why I say that. They have most amazing visual system, most amazing attack system, and the most amazing visual system. They have 12 opsin neurons that range all the way from 300 nanometers to 700 nanometers of an opsin neuron. So they see light across this amazing spectrum. Right? But to me, the thing that's interesting is they have 650 nanometers and 700. And remember, they live underwater where there's none of that light, very little of that light makes it. So they're looking at something that's red. And it's probably not from sunlight. So we all know that corals fluoresce like crazy. So if you ever want to go to the lot, go down to a lot, you get go at night, you take some blue lights and wear yellow goggles, and it's like it's like an acid trip. Um, <laughs> I didn't say that, but you know, whatever an acid trip would be like. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is what I hear. This is a white like white light of a piece of coral, and this is a coral with blue light and, and a yellow filter. So the corals, all almost all sclerotinian hard corals have tons of show you what I mean by ton. And they put it in different places, they have different colors, they green and red. But like I said, us and other people for 10 years have been cloning these things and we published a whole bunch of papers on it that nobody reads about all the different kinds of patterns and different kinds of corals and everything. And they're all GFPs and we don't know what they're doing. Uh, but we haven't really, now all the droplet proteins that have helped us with super resolution are all based on modified coral proteins. So I'm not saying that this isn't a good place to keep looking and we continue to look there. But this photograph, that we took during an art project, believe it or not. We, we had this special camera built to photograph fluorescence underwater, and 
we got approached by the Museum of Natural History in New York to shoot a montage of a big, beautiful reef at night in both white light and in um, and fluorescent light. So we put our special lights and cameras and we shot all these pictures. And this professional photographer was helping us shoot us, and he was sending photographs to me when I left. And this is coral fluorescence, what it looks like. It's, uh, and this is a, a very scared octopus that's not really fluorescent. It's just, he's just went white because it's fluorescent light. So he was reflecting the excitation light and it gets through the filter. But in this corner, Remember, fluorescent proteins have been found only in um, invertebrates, things like cnidaria, which are corals, or anemones, or even up to copepods, but never in a vertebrate. And this was intensely light fluorescent. So the guys in the museum, they all got excited about it. They could actually identify the eel. This is the only photograph we have. We didn't have a bright light. Didn't even know he was in the picture. It was about this big. And uh, they could identify by the shape of his nose and his eyes that it was what they call a coxid eel, which is an exceedingly rare cryptic eel that lives in the, in the, in the, around the world. If you go online and look for them now, you'll see like three photos of them because they're so rare. They're not like more eels or things like that. So we spent three years diving, terrible conditions, in the Caribbean, <laughs> looking for these eels, um, and found two, okay? After, I don't know, like 60, 70 hours underwater. Uh, here's one of the two species specimens. Today, we only have two of this, this species. It's intensely fluorescent animal, right? Been, if I held it here and turned the lights up, it's going to shine a blue light on you can see it. The whole head, the whole body, the whole uh, musculature is bright green. Right? So what we did is the modern era, we, we, we didn't try to PCR the GFPs that are in it, we just transcriptomed the entire organism. right? So we transcriptomed the muscle and did every gene in the muscle expression and there were no GFPs. No GFP sequences at all. So we were all very excited. So we took some of that same eel, and remember there's still one eel, so he's like little sausage in the freezer, we just kept cutting off pieces. <laughs> so pictures and blah, blah, blah. Everything you see here got from that one set. Um, got one later, but uh, so we took some of the muscle, we ground it up, we ran it on a native gel, right? So this is non denatured, so no SDS, right? And we run it down, you get all this smear of protein, and there you go at the bottom, you see two bands, two fluorescent proteins, right? They're in the protein. If you boil it, the fluorescence goes away, right? So it's probably a protein. So we got very excited, so we, we took this and we ran it on an HPLC, again, non denatured, collected fractions and picked out fractions that had the highly fluorescent. And then we sent those off to mass spec, right? Found the mass spec, and we found this protein, it's not a GFP, and then someone else published it. Just <laughs> so another lesson learned, uh, very depressing. <coughs> Shown that picture in that exhibit at the Museum of Natural History two years. It took two years, three years to find the eel, two years after we found the eel to, uh, to finish this story, and in that time, someone was much better at it. Uh, Sushi Miyawaki saw this, we saw that it was actually a really old paper by some guys who worked in, in eel aquaculture. It was in a journal that we never looked at. That said, another lesson learned. Always check the eel aquaculture journal. <laughs> uh, there was a paper saying that these umami eels, the ones you guys eat for sushi or you eat them, those eels are fluorescent, very deeply fluorescent. Please don't tell me you eat them next time. And uh, they saw this, these guys saw that, they saw our picture in the Museum of Natural and they did a quick job and found the protein in a different eel. Though. So this is this, they call this Unaji from Unami, uh, the Unami sushi eel. Looks a lot like GFP, about half the size though, right? Different chromophore. The chromophore in this case is bilirubin. A bilirubin is non-fluorescent. It's the thing that's a breakdown of heme that shows up in the blood. It's problematic for anybody who have children. Sometimes they have early stage uh, bilirubinia in their blood. Uh, that's GFP. So it's that protein. What it is, it's a lipid binding protein that's all over. There's lots of these, hundreds of these proteins. But for some, and they bind lipids and non-fluorescent. Somehow this gene, so this is ours, we call it the Clotsid FP, this is a very clumsy name, but we're still going to get a better name. Um, ours is similar, but not identical to the gene, quite different. Again, that was an eel from the Pacific Ocean, this is from the Caribbean. Um, so uh, compared to all other uh, lipid binding proteins, this has this insertion, this GPP insertion, which is necessary for the binding of the bilirubin. So you can convert a protein that binds lipids to one that binds bilirubin by inserting that GPP. Ours is slightly different in excitation and emission wavelength. So what that tells you is the same with GFP. If you alter the protein sequence, you can alter the, the properties of the chromophore, just like GFP. You can start to shift the fluorescence. 
has this can here, but on the back side is a groove that the Billy Rubin has to get into. So the advantages of making your own chromophore is you can make it from within. This is like a rapid prototype thing, right? You can, you can build it inside. So this chromophore is built inside, inside a can, and that's what makes it really resistant to aging. It holds that chromophore still. If you take the GFP chromophore out of the GFP, it doesn't glow even, just like Billy Rubin, right? It only grows when it's when it's held rigid in the, in the plant arrangement inside of the thing of this, but this has a, a groove now, there's an advantage of that is that if it bleaches, it can come out in places when it's not bleached. So that's something you see. You see it bleach, and you wait a while, and it comes back. But GSP doesn't come back because once it's bleached, it's dead. So this can theoretically recover from bleach. So it does bleach a little faster, but that's something we're working on. The original GSP bleached pretty fast, too, but people built better ones. So we're hoping we can build a better one now, so we're mutually. Um, it expresses beautifully in the men themselves. You ask yourself, is it enough Billy Rubin? Same question they asked when they made options in the brain. Are there enough? But, you know, even though we got scooped badly by our Japanese friends, we, what we came away with that, ex that ex thing is that um, we looked for fluorescence in fish, and we found, we published a paper last year, they didn't publish. We published uh, a paper where we described 180 species of fish in the Pacific Ocean that are highly fluorescent. So there's a little trip down fluorescent fish lane. There's all different, um, I don't know a lot about fish, but there are a lot of different, they span an entire realm of, of sort of fish film, as it were. There are teleos, So we've, we've now done transcriptomes on about 20 of these organisms, and none of them have GFP or the yield protein. So yield protein is only an eel, and these things have something else. Some of them are not proteins that are fluorescent, and some of them we think are. So this thing is a whole a rich hunting ground for new stuff there. Um, we've since cloned eel proteins from all of these varieties of eels, including morays. Some morays are weak to fluorescent, uh, but almost every species of eel has a different form of that protein in it. Um, we're very excited. So what the lab has done is gone around looking for that, and we've lots of things that are fluorescent, and we've shifted gears in the past two years that our lab, and this is, we don't have anything, don't have anything to show you in probes, I'm going to show you pretty pictures of fun, fun things we're doing. We're going into the deep ocean and looking for bioluminescent um, substrates. We're looking for new reactions. There's a lot of bioluminescent reactions that are out there, but there's none, there's no bioluminescent reaction that can be fully genetically coded. So what we want is to have cells that produce like these are dinoflagellates in this case. We'd like to sort of have neurons that do this, that produce their own light. So we're searching for a probe that will flash light, it doesn't require any excitation light, but will flash upon uh, uh, action sensors. Now there are calcium sensitive bioluminescences that are out there and we're sort of working to try to develop those. Bioluminescence requires the luciferase, which is an enzyme that produces this light, and then a fuel, the luciferin. And the luciferase can be encoded genetically, <coughs> Have not, the pathways for luciferins have not been developed. So we're trying to clone the pathways that produce the fuel and so that we can put those into cells, the cells that produce the fuel. So we made this kind of interesting discovery. We built a really cool, this is one of those 4 foot 4 cameras. I don't know if you're familiar with this. We put this into a housing and brought it under water. The whole computer and everything in, in one housing. We stuck it on this shove over here. This is the guy let us use right here. And then went to water. At, this was at about um, 600 meters down. We sort of discovered flash light into the dark, you know, blue water dive, and it's just you're diving to calm the water, which is sitting in the middle of the sea, something beautiful. It goes down about a uh, thousand meters, so it's sort of sitting in the middle. At night, there are all these sort of bottom feeding organisms that come up through the columns. There's all kinds of plankton and stuff. So we found that, although it's some of it's sort of flashing by one essence, if you flash at it, it will flash back at you. And that was something which was a real surprise to us, and it's not reported in the literature. And we took with this high-speed camera, high -speed
the usual characters that people think about. That's the experiment, actually. That's what the video looks like there. As you're cruising through the water, you see me flash a flash from inside the, the cell, and then these things become flesh. And you, you can't cover this on an ROV. You have to be there because your eyes are still more sensitive, or unless you use a camera like this. And this is the first time that kind of camera has been brought underwater. This, I'd show you this last thing, because this is from last week in July. Let me show you what we've been up to lately. We, we bought this vehicle and built this vehicle, which is a remote operated vehicle. It's this maiden voyage, and it's called Deep Reef. <laughs> That's a good name. And it's to go down and collect stuff on the reef, to collect specifically in the deeper reefs. So you guys have reefs. Most people die at 60, 70 feet, maybe 100, 200 feet. We occasionally go to 250. But beyond 250 feet, people never really dive that on reefs, because it's just too deep. So we um, built a vehicle. This thing can go down 1,000 uh, feet. Uh, so that's about a meter, sorry. Um, so it's quite deep. And you have light, and you have coral all the way down that deep. So we, we, we were working with these guys at Harvard and built this weird finger here. Uh, that's what actually what we were testing, this thing. Uh, it's a way to grab the coral, because the, the arm that was on this thing is a sort of metal crank. The arm crushes. And so these guys developed this, this thing, which it's sort of lit like this. And you move with the arm. Same case with all bolts of dye recordings that are ever done. You apply the dye, it, it goes to 
now we need to invert the circle. We're not done. Yeah? Um, you're showing some uh, changes to the square root of uh, 3 percent and 2 percent. Can you say something about the nice one and the stability of the nice one? So, so we use um, mostly LED and laser light sources, and mostly LED works fine. What, mo everything I showed you was with standard laboratory lighting. Now, not old arc lamps that a lot of people may still have in there. In there. Those don't generally work because arc lamps have a lot of noise in them. They, the arc in arc lamps tends to kind of flip around. and the, 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 If you look at these tends to be your arc lamps, they tend to go up and down. Also tends to drift the heat. So you need, you need LED sources that don't have two types of noise. So LED sources come with two types of noise. Well, three types of noise. They come with high frequency noise because they use switching amplifiers. And those can produce a very high frequency that you don't notice if you're taking a picture, you know, long exposure on a CCD camera or whatever. But if you're trying to record high speed, you can you can pick up the rhythms and usually usually the switchers are very high, but you can get a sort of morose pattern out of it. So you don't want that. The second one is line noise. You'll often get 60 cycle noise that comes through. Uh, the fourth kind is long-term drift. So LEDs have to be very well thermally grounded. And over, over time they will start to slide. Now that happens because a lot of people don't use shutters with LED light sources. They just turn the LED on and off. And so if you buy a light source, it should be heat stable. Turn it on, it will go up in intensity, and as soon as the LED dies, starts to warm up, it will drop in its intensity. So they're often current locked, they don't have feedback. So they're ones which have light feedback, which will set the light and keep it constant. That's what you want. You want your expectation light to be constant. Because you've already got bleaching of your probes, which is inherent. You don't want another, you know, subtraction of your bulb sort of getting different, right? So there are ones out there. Uh, there's one called Cool LED that's very good. It's an Israeli company that makes one of that are stabilized light sources. And the smelling a lot of these things for people who don't care about high speed. If you do, you should. Now, we use lasers sometimes because we want to get tighter excitations. It's a criticism I have for the, for the work of Adam Cohen's lab of those oxygen-based probes. Those look very beautiful ones I showed you. Those are done with 850 watts per whatever it is, 850 watts per it, it will burn a hole in the animal's head if you use an animal. So it's really not a fair comparison. It's a very long wavelength that they use, and they're using so when they shoot it, right, and it comes to the dish, it just goes right through the dish, right? It goes into the microscope. It's okay. When you have a head of an animal, that light doesn't interact much with, with tissue, but it does interact enough that it doesn't go out the animal's head the other side. So the animal has to absorb that amount of wattage, and it's just not, it'll never work for you. And they have to do that because the signal's so low. To get the noise, to get the noise low, they have to increase the intensity. Right. You mentioned the problem of, of membranes and dendrites, because you're, you know, a mess of neurofilms. Sensory neurons and vertebrates don't have dendrites. They've only got axons. And some of them are, are very nicely exposed, the surface of the cornea, for example. Do you ever look at cornea with, with your light? No, you know? no, but I think that those are the situations where this will probably be so. And, 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 and since sensory neurons look somewhat like drosophila neurons in the sense that they have a cell body and then they have processes all the way. This is probably the perfect situation for this kind of cornea because you don't have a massive neurofilm. So we haven't done that yet. And then, like I said, these mice are available as Fox mice, if people want them. They're part of that, they, they were made by Allen, but they're <coughs> that intersectional, if anybody follows this, this intersectional expression thing, which is a little complicated to breed, but when you do, they, they, they're very bright. So if anybody has a Cree line that they like, you can breed them with these, these mice and they'll get, they'll get, but you know, maybe their favorite neuron. Yeah. So, can I ask a question about uh, motivation? Motivation, good. Yeah. That's kind of what has reoccurred in my 
lecture was in, and you know, we did great recording, but we didn't have the power of this enormous field, right? And so I thought, you know, it was that moment, so I thought this is the thing I need to do. But it's dangerous, it's dangerous for me, because I showed you that period that nothing happened, and that was the period where I was supposed to get tenure, right? So at the end of that period, uh, and Arc Life to me was, was, a, was a savior to me, because it came out a year before my tenure. But I can tell you that if it had not, I probably would not have tenure, I probably wouldn't be here, I probably wouldn't have been a movie or something. Yeah. But <laughs> it's, it's a risky thing with your career. I dropped, I was sort of a known guy in the snappy transmission world. I worked with Paul Greengard, and then he had a Nobel Prize the year I left the lab. So I was sailing forward on that career, and I decided to sort of take a risk and sort of drop that science. I said, I have a new lab, They've already given me money. They can't fire me for a couple of years, so I'm going to take this risk, you know. And I did, and 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 it was difficult because it was hard to get funding. So actually, for me, I got money from the Defense Department because they're kind of don't know what they're doing, so they fund the story. But <laughs> NIH always reviewed the grants and said this is never going to work, right? This we're not going to get this to work. You guys don't hear it, but there was a list of reasons I could show you the piece sheets from those days why you'll never have a signal that will work, and the G cams were predicted to not work, right? All of you know, you can look back bitter or just look back on opportunity at the time. And in my mind, you know, it was risky to do that, but I think it obviously for me paid off. It was the same with this kind of work underwater. We, we've been doing this for 10 years, we've been scrambling to get money from all different sources to do it. Never gotten a grant from NIH or from a large funding agency to do all that work underwater. Now we have that because, you know, it's sort of, but it, it took sort of creativity to get the money. And I just, I still feel in my mind that, you know, if you see an opportunity, you see something, and you see the future, it's best to just go for that and work hard, rather than just continue doing the things that everybody else is doing. I felt like I knew physiology well enough to understand limitations of a lecture. And, you know, I'm not critical of them. I'm just saying that there's a future, and this might be some part of part of the future. Yeah? Is the nuclear war about the possibility of recording the atom? So that's a good question. So what about absolute voltage? So, so the way that the calcium world did that, pre-GKM. Pre so the advantage is that a lot of the small molecules, for those of you not familiar, there are this field is preceded in the calcium world by small molecule calcium dyes. Richard, uh, Roger Chen was the hero of that era. He created a lot of these uh, calcium centers. What they are, they were probes that would go in like Fura, Mac Fura, things like these are These are molecules that would bind calcium <coughs> and change their fluorescence. Now, in those years, there were probes that were you could ratio the probe. So what that meant is like you had a, um, I don't have a, a pen, but uh, can we move this? Okay. So if you have a probe like Fura, Fura looks like this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to your point. It may sound long. But Fura has an excitation spectrum that looks basically like that. and has an emission spectrum here. And it has what's called an isobestic point, which is here. And when you change calcium concentration, and I'm going to do this wrong, so please don't quote me on it. One of them goes up, and I don't remember. One goes up, but the other goes down. Right? So as you increase calcium concentration, it looks like this. Right? So you can ratio, and there were these microscopes that everybody bought, which would rapidly switch excitation from this to this. Right? And you would see a signal that one signal would go down, and the other signal would go up. Now you can take that ratio, right? and you can do that in a cuvette with known amounts of calcium. And you can end up with a curve which tells you that when the ratio is, is x or y, you have an absolute amount of ca calcium, as best as you can get. There are, there are some details in there, but really, when the molecule is in, is, looks like this, then you know that that's a certain concentration of calcium. So when you look in a cell and you see that ratio, because the ratio helps you eliminate differences in the amount of the probe, right? So the ratio can give you the quantity. So voltage dyes, currently the ones that we have, Arclight has an, ex an excitation spectrum that looks like this, like all the wild type GFPs do. But, but, and that's something I didn't go into details, this peak, we always excite here, which is like 490. But the, four, the 390 peak, or the sort of 405, and somewhere about there, that peak, uh, the signal actually goes up. Right? And this here goes down. So if we ratio these two, theoretically, we could get the absolute. The problem is that this doesn't. This is bad elimination attempts for you to use. Nobody wants to be in the in the blue. So what we need is a probe with either or the emission ratio. If you can emission the ratio or the or the excitation, you can get absolute. You can you can take a cell patch clamp and go through the steps and say, okay, when the ratio looks like this, that's exactly minus 60 volts. So there's a possibility to get that. And if, you know, not many people want it, but some people. I always say like I have a customer base, right? Customers most.
mostly want spiking neurons. So that's a, not, I don't bill things for customers. I bill it for myself. But I have one customer who says, we want spikes only. Some people say, I want to know the absolute voltage. So that would require a different probe. Right? Some people say, I only want to look at dendrites and subthresholds. That 